The proceeds from these cemetery tours are used to restore markers. And we've done this for the last several years. We haven't restored any markers on this side, but these are in pretty good shape over here. It's over on the south side, those older markers are in quite a bad, you know, need a lot of repair. We did Heinrich Agee's marker a number of years ago, and most recently we did Maggie Mobley and her son Seth, is that right? And, and uh, those were the first couple that we did. We're looking at possibly uh, the Weeby marker. If you look at it over there, we call it the weaning, leaning tower of Weeby. It's leaning quite severely. And we're a little afraid it's going to fall over someday. So anyway, uh, Michelle Setlick over here and Sue Clement are the coordinators of this. But Sue can't be here this weekend because she has a family commitment, a death in the family. So she's taking care of that. So I'll turn it over to Michelle and she will tell you more about what we're doing. And uh, we've got Bill back here too and he's got another microphone on. And Larry here with his camera is going to be videoing uh, the presentations today. So when we get to a marker and start the presentation, there'll be a little pause till he gets set up, and then we'll start. Okay. There you go. All right. And because we do have the video going on, if you all want to just come on over here, and we'll come around this side on the on the tree um, underneath the shade. A nice crowd tonight. It's a beautiful night too. I mean, was anyone here last year? It was hotter than blazes last year, so I'm kind of grateful that we have the uh, better Sorry. weather tonight. But we will still, every time we can, we'll try to get you in shade. We'll try to keep you out of the sun as much as we possibly can. So, uh, welcome. You know, Fred already introduced a lot of people. I also want to introduce uh, Renee Hunt over here. She's going to be doing some presentations, and um, and of course. Fred mentioned Bill right here, Bill Bolte. He's our, um, what do you want to call it, foreign exchange? Yeah. yeah. Bill is uh, from the Merritt County Historical Society, but he is so generous to come over here and help us. He's a symbology expert, and uh, he's really good with the dousing too. So we're really grateful that Bill comes over and helps us with this. And then of course, yes, my name is Michelle Selig, and um, I'll be doing some of the presentations tonight too. One of the things I want to tell you, everyone here is a volunteer. We are all volunteers. We do this just because we love it and because we want to preserve the history of the, the community. We want to share it with all of you. So, um, and again, thank you all for coming out. But I want to welcome you to the new side of the Grand Island Cemetery. This is the new side because it was established in 1897, which still makes it new. The south side of the cemetery um, was actually established first. Uh, there were actually a couple different cemeteries there that kind of grew together, uh, including the GAR cemetery and then a private cemetery operated by uh, two attorneys in town, Mr. Thummel and Mr. Platt. Uh, they, a lot of times cemeteries early on were, um, no, be back. Okay. Uh, cemeteries early on, if they weren't associated with a church, it was a private cemetery. And so Mr. Thummel and Mr. Platt, uh, they came out here in the 1860s, uh, actually with the railroad, Platt, uh, they were with the railroad. They bought all of this land from uh, the south side of the cemetery, the north side, all the way to the Sugar Beet Pack factory, that was all theirs. They bought it on speculation. So on the south side of the road, they started, um, they started plotting that and selling, oops, did I lose you? Oh, there we go. They started uh, plotting that and selling the lots to people. Um, and like I said, in 1897, they decided they wanted to sell the land. So they actually sold everything on the south side and then um, 70 acres on the north side to the city. Um, both Thumbel and Platt, neither one of them are buried here. Platt's father's buried here. He went farther west to California. Uh, Thummel's wife is buried over on the other side too along with her parents but he actually was buried by his mother in Illinois. Uh, interesting note, her um, Thummel's wife was um, Linus Smith when he married her. Her uncle was Jedediah Smith, the explorer. And she was uh, supposedly one of the first white babies born in California. 
But um, so when the city bought this land over here, the record keeping was kind of spotty. And actually what had happened in um, 1887, April of 1887, there was a huge windstorm that came along and blew down the maintenance shed. And with it blew away the book, the record book. And there was a notice in the paper asking if anyone finds the book, please return it. Well, I don't think anyone ever found the book because when the city took over in 1897, they put a notice in the paper asking if anyone had plots over on the other side, please bring your receipts, your deeds, whatever, your bill of sale to the city clerk's office so they could record it. Um, they say that the south side is completely full. It may or may not be. We don't know for sure because some of those plots um, may not have anyone buried in them. They aren't all accounted for. When the, they plotted the south side, if you've been over there, you'll notice that the rows, the streets run east and west, straight rows. This side was uh, designed in a wagon wheel. And when you, when you come over here, they're, they're plotted um, in sections. They're alphabetical sections. There is no A and there is no O section because they can be too easily construed as numbers. But everything else is in a section alphabetical around the wheel. The whole idea of the wagon wheel design was the center area was a place that you could gather for celebrations, for Memorial um, Day. There would be a flagpole usually in the center. There actually is a flagpole still there. And it has not been used in years, but the city actually has their uh, well right there in the middle now because there are no graves in the middle of the circle. Um, and then also I wanted to tell you, well, has anyone ever seen what this uh, cemetery looks like from the air? Have you ever flown over? It's kind of cool. And if you want to see it, I have a picture I can show you um, as we walk. But I'm going to go ahead and at this point turn it over to Bill. But anyway, we'll start off here. Uh, there's not a lot that I can talk about except that there are bronze markers along here uh, on some of these stones. Uh, them usually belong to fraternal organizations, um, especially the round ones or the GAR. They are for the military, but you will have some that are for the uh, uh, Rebecca sisters, the Daughters of the Catholic Organization, Knights of Columbus, the Fire Department, uh, the Betsy Hager chapter, which is here in Grand Island. You will see them around here. If you will look over here to the left, just towards that tree, just in front of it, there is a lamb on the top of that stone. The lamb is usually always has an undocked tail on it. That's always a symbol of purity, and it's always on a child's grave is where you'll find it. Another one that is fairly common would be the uh, dove, and that's another one that uh, kind of represents the Holy Spirit, but you'll find that on a child's grave most of the time. The stone up there in the front that says uh, Schumann on it, you see that's not finished is the way it looks like and usually that represents that life is not finished for that particular person he had more years probably to go but accident whatever who knows might have uh, uh, died early anyway and then we'll see military markers out here um, that are mostly marble um, and we'll see a couple up here at the front so if we'll start off I uh, will follow me and Let's see if I can keep from getting you lost. That will be a GAR marker, Civil War veteran. The cross on uh, the stones is usually a Christian uh, marker. If uh, there is Christ on the uh, cross, it will probably be a Catholic person. Uh, the Catholic believes in the uh, Christ being on the cross where other religions do not believe. They believe that he has ascended to heaven already. Yannick was one of the first settlers here in Hamilton County. He came in 1857 with the rest of the people from uh, Davenport, Iowa. Yankee. And Yankee. Okay, I didn't, I, start, I say it wrong. That's all right. My grandmother was a Yankee. Okay. <laughs> Correct me then. And if I, if you see anything out here that you want me to point out, uh, we'll try, or if you got a story about some marker that we go past, well, we'd like to hear about it if we could. Yeah, and here's your lamb right here on this one. You'll notice he has the undocked tail. When, uh, 
the Bible says that when Christ comes, he will be coming from the east. This is to represent that the person will be rising up to face Christ uh, coming from the east. The majority of the people uh, are buried this way, but there are cemeteries where there will be east and west. And just a little story I can talk about, one down by Dewey's, Nebraska. The person was um, a member of the church, but uh, money to it, but he never did attend church. The pastor at the church, when he died, would not let him be buried in the cemetery. The congregation raised such a stink about it that uh, he, he paid his dues, he paid his pew rent and everything. But he finally consented, and he went and buried him crosswise. So you look in the cemetery, his stone is crosswise, and he supposedly when he dies, it, it'll be uh, north and south is where that person is at. Yes? Right? That's just the way they put the stone on. No, that's... Most of most of these are headstones. Otherwise, if they're buried on the backside, then they would have a footstone. Some we don't know. It is. That that could very well be. And one thing I want to point out real quick. If you've been out here before, you'll notice uh, the cemetery crew, they do an amazing job out here taking care of this cemetery. It is a beautiful cemetery. When they first took over, when the city first took over in 1897, um, that first year they asked people to come out and help clean up the cemetery before Memorial Day. A lot of times families would take care of their own plots anyway. Um, but at, by that point, the cemetery was about 30 years old. And some people, as you know, move on and there were plots that needed to be taken care of, so the city asked everyone to come out and help take care of it that first year. About 20 years later, it was reported in the Independent that they were complaining that the city was not doing a very good job. There was overgrown hedges, there was roads that weren't being maintained, fences that were falling down. Uh, the following year, though, they came back and were praising the city and the job that they were doing. All the lots out here, even if they were purchased prior to the city having perpetual care as part of uh, the price of the the plot they were selling, the city still does take care of all of them. And when Fred was talking earlier about the Maggie Mobley stone that we repaired on the other side, um, actually that stone, it cost us about $700 to raise the stone and clean it up and have it reset. And the city went, ahead, uh, the cemetery crew went ahead and took care of placing um, the base underneath for us. So. They really do a good job taking care of all the plots out here, even the older ones that don't have family to take care of them anymore. Back to your question about the headstone and the footstone. On some cemeteries, you will find two stones on it. One will have the headstone, another one will have a smaller footstone at the bottom of it. And it may just have the initials of that particular person carved in it. It's got two people named on it. It's got uh, John Mon Maroney on it. And it's got his wife on it, but when you look down, he's got his death date on it, but her death date is not on it. So evidently, I'm thinking that she moved on or remarried somebody else. But I'll show you, he's got a uh, union marker on it. And when you douse it, there is only one body here. When the rods cross, there's a body there but there's only one. You come back across, and I only find one, one particular person on that grave, even though there is two stones. So he evidently he got a military stone afterwards, and um, Michelle is going to show you whether if it's a uh, male or female that's buried there. Watch, watch the rod swinging. It's uh, a male on that particular one. Right. It does not work for me, but it will work for other people. But the dowsing part, I can do that. I can find the trails with it and all that kind of stuff. But the what? Trails. The marmot by dowsing. My theory is, is that the animals 
or the people walked across this particular spot so many times that they compacted the soil to make it dows. So I can find the Mormon Oregon trails and I have an Indian trail that starts up north of Palmer and uh, it's between 1200 and 1400 years old when it was the, the site was there. These people, they're called the It's Kerry. They left, but they had friends of the Wichita down in Kansas, and I'm able to mark that trail all the way from north of Palmer down to Oklahoma right now. Oh right, you can follow. And they had no horses or anything like that. It just had to be the people dragging their driveways or hooking them up to the dogs, that kind of thing. So, yeah. And you can still find in certain areas where it's never been um, disturbed by farming or whatever, uh, you can still find trail ruts of where they went, and it's like 13 steps wide. Those two markers there have what I call Japanese writing on them. I mean, I don't know Japanese from Chinese, but I'm thinking that it's uh, two Japanese uh, people buried there. There is one here. This white one right here, that one has Christ hanging on the cross. So that particular person was probably Catholic. This one here has got Mary, M-C-O-U-A-D-E on it, 1838 to 1914, but it is a union symbol on uh, that uh, for a marker. And this one has got Jasper, M-C-Q-U-A-D-E. He was the uh, acting assistant engineer. He was born in 1939 and 1912. I don't know if they're married, were married. She evidently was a nurse or something to that effect that she would be affiliated with the uh, GAR. I don't know anything else about it. Yes. I don't mean to interrupt, no. but back here it says St. Francis Hospital Inmates. Um, Michelle, this stone says St. Francis Hospital Inmates. What can you tell me? I don't know. They were either good people or bad people. Well, it, it could be um, the pauper area too, the people who were patients in the hospital who didn't have um, means or family or means, yep. Because there is, there is um, some pauper plots out here too. So that could be one of the, uh, possibly the Sisters of St. Francis set up for people who are, who are indigent who couldn't pay for their own funerals. And before we move on, since you all kind of have a little bit of shade here as we head up this way, I want to kind of share a little bit. There, as you see, there are lots of different stones out here. A lot of beautiful ones, very elaborate ones, some that are more simple. In 1927, there was an article in The Independent talking about the stones in the cemetery. At that time, they estimated there were 6,000 people buried here in the cemetery. And the value of the stones at that time for all of those people they were estimating right around four hundred thousand dollars there's a pretty extensive i mean and th this is 1927 that's a lot of money i wouldn't even want to hazard a guess how much these are worth today but at that time they also talked about uh that some of the stones were very simplistic you know some of them were just a, a straight slab some of them at that point they said it was kind of the trend to be have some mausoleums and some um mo uh monia <laughs> Monument, thank you. Monument stones, that was kind of the trend. They were having a lot more of the really big stones out here. They even mentioned, and we're going to walk by it here a little bit, one of the most elaborate stones that a man had um, built for his wife. It was built of pristine marble. It was expected to be one of a kind in the West. And they estimated that it was 25 tons. Right? 25 tons. It's a big one. You'll see it when we walk by here and you'll know. Um, but they also talked about uh, the stones and they said, you know, the more that you acquired in your life, the bigger your stone could be in your death. Uh, some of the stones they were estimating were costing about $20,000 a piece at that time. And again, this is 1927. $20,000, I mean, stones right now, they're, they're not cheap, right? Um, but for $20,000 back then, you could get something pretty impressive, which a lot of them did. Um, they said it wasn't a, a testament to an individual that they didn't have the resources in life, um, but the ones who did work hard in life could have a 
beautiful stone to slumber under for the eternal life. While we're talking about the stones, in uh, Sears and Roebuck catalog, you could have bought stones for $16. Uh, grand stones and a stone would have looked similar to that one or these smaller ones right here is what they would look like the uh, etching on it or putting the names on was extra but uh, you would have ordered it if they misspelled it that was your problem um, there was, they're not going to change it for you but the 1902 Sears and Robot catalog will have um, for $16. And even those Sears and Roebuck catalog, there were different levels of stones. Yes. You could get the same stone in different price points, uh, depending on the workmanship and quality you wanted the stones. And some of those you can definitely tell as they've uh, aged over the years. See that stone over there with the urn on top of it? That's an old Egyptian uh, type of uh, urn. And back in the time of the Egyptians, uh, they would uh, take the body parts like uh, the organs and uh, they would put them in the urn thinking that the body would come back to life. So that's usually what the urn represents, is uh, that the body will come back to life. Uh, to my left, you see the stone over there with the pointy top on it? That's uh, the pyramid on it. There's another one right over here. Uh, that's eternity, and it was supposed that a pyramid-shaped stone prevented the devil from reclining on a grave to make it uncomfortable for the devil. So, and then. There's another ball over here representing life eternal and uh, the other pyramids. Um, there is a stone here that's flat. Uh, that's usually the pillar, pillar of the community or a pillar of the family. And now that it's uh, de deceased, why uh, it's laying flat uh, instead of being upright as the, the pillar of the community. So I want to thank you for coming. I am going to be um, doing a portrayal right now, and the person I'm going to be portraying is right here. Uh, her name is Olive Dale Augustine. Okay. So I want to thank you for coming tonight. Uh, this obviously is the Augustine family plot. My name is Olive Dale Augustine. I am the uh, daughter of uh, Irving Milton Augustine and Alice Fitzsimmons. I was the second child born to the family. I have an older brother. His name was Ernst. Uh, I have uh, two younger brothers, Howard, but we called him Mike, and Irving. Uh, I also had another brother who perished when he was eight years old, Raymond. Uh, Raymond is back here behind uh, the big family marker. He was eight years old. Uh, he had peritonitis, awful way to die. And then uh, we have also back here a little stone that just simply says babies. So the family, um, let me take you back just a minute. We actually originated in Pennsylvania, and that's where my grandparents originated. Isaac Newton Augustine, who's buried this direction, he was a uh, pastor. He was a Lutheran minister, and uh, in 1865, after the Civil War, he decided he wanted to venture further west. He became a pioneer pastor. So he started, he went to Missouri and then Illinois. Eventually he came to Nebraska in 1881 uh, to the Hebron area and preached there for a while. Uh, that's where my father graduated from high school. He went to the University of Nebraska. And um, then he married my mother, Alice Fitzsimmons. Uh, Ernst and I were both born in Hebron. The family then, grandfather uh, received a, a position in Hastings. When he moved to Hastings, we all moved along with him, but we came here to Grand Island. My father was a newspaper man. In Hebron, he published a newspaper. And then when he came here, he bought a newspaper in Donovan called the Donovan Eagle. He published that for a few years and then came to Grand Island where he um, turned the Eagle into a newspaper called the Free Press. He also published a newspaper called the uh, Central Republican. Don't let the name fool you. My father was very democratic. Um, he was very much a Democrat and his paper was as such. In those days, newspapers, uh, they were very abashedly one party or another and they proclaimed it proudly in their, in their headlines. Uh, so at that time, the Republican newspaper was the Independent. There was also the Grand Island Times. Um, 
but then there was the Grand Island Democrat and the Free Press and the Central Republican. There were, um, at different times um, in the early 18 or late 1800s, um, up to a dozen newspapers at a time being published in the area. Eventually, father got out of the newspaper business and started a printing company called Augustine Printing Company. Um, Augustine was uh, well known for printing calendars and other materials, and we, uh, our company printed um, not just here in Grand Island, but we had salesmen that went out across the country uh, promoting the, the business and selling um, our product, including my brother Mike. He was one of those salesmen. Uh, as the only daughter, I um, went to college myself. I went to Omaha to Clarkson Hospital, where I received my degree in nursing in 1914. When World War I broke out, or the first war, wasn't supposed to be a second one, my two brothers, uh, Irving, or Milton, no, sorry, Mike, which is Howard, and um, Ernst both went and registered for the draft. Ernst claimed an exemption uh, because he was the business manager for the printing company, um, and he had a family already at that time. Mike did not. Mike got called up, and he was sent to France. I, at that time, enlisted in the U.S. Army Corps of Nursing. There were about 400 nurses at that time, and they desperately needed nurses. At that time, to be a nurse in the Army, you had to be single, and you had to be between the ages of 25 and 35. I was 30 at the time that I enlisted. I, was, I served the entire time in uh, stateside in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. During that time, Mike and I, we corresponded back and forth um, from Oklahoma to France, uh, communicating the things that were going on in our lives, sharing different things, um, funny things about home. Um, I actually, I might have at one point, um, poked a little fun at Ernst, saying that he was so serious, but he kind of had to be because he was, he was in charge of the family operation. My younger brother, Irving, he also um, enlisted when he became old enough. Uh, he went to basic training, and fortunately, he never made it out of basic training before armistice was declared. So he never had to go overseas and fight like poor Mike did. Um, working in the hospital in Oklahoma, I saw a lot of devastation. I saw a lot of young men who um, came back with all kinds of injuries. There was a lot of illness, and I myself came down with the flu in uh, December of 1918, the Spanish influenza. And back home, uh, several members of my family were also suffering from the same fate. Fortunately, none of us succumbed to the, the flu. Um, I was only down for about a week, and then I was back on the floor again, taking care of patients. I stayed with the Army until June of 1920, when I was finally discharged. I came back home for a short period of time. And then three months later, some friends of mine, we were all nurses, we went overseas, we went to Britain uh, and Ireland to help over there any way we could. And fortunately, while I was there, I became deathly, deathly ill. Um, they didn't even know if I was going to make it back. My uncle, um, on the Fitzsimmons side, my mother's brother, was a doctor in Omaha, and he came over to England and took care of me, nursed me back to health enough uh, that I was able to come back here um, and be with my family. But for the rest of my life, I was under the care of doctors. I never really completely recovered my health, and I passed away in uh, 1938. Unfortunately, my brother Mike passed away a few years later. He suffered the effects of um, gas when he was in the trenches in France and developed respiratory problems. But the Augustine family um, stayed here in Grand Island, it did a lot of good. Uh, the Augustine um, Ernst donated land, which is now the Boy Scout uh, camp, Camp Augustine. Um, my niece, um, Mercedes, was a talented artist. Um, I have other nieces and nephews that are still here. Um, so we, we persisted, we, we lasted, but um, that is the story of the Augustine. Oh, and I should say, I don't know if I said this or not, the babies, they were, they were buried in Hebron and they were brought here in 1915. I don't know if I said that or not. 
So that is the story of the Augustine family. Um, Julius Lashinsky, uh, the tombstone, as uh, Bill pointed out, um, not every time is it correct, because he was actually uh, christened Julius Frederick Paul Lashinsky. And so there's a conflict with the tombstone, which that never happens with tombstones, anybody that does genealogy, right? Well, he was born in 1860 in Prussia. And when he was 19, he immigrated to uh, the United States and quickly learned English. He actually even became a teacher. And for those first few years, he had a numerous uh, odd jobs. He was a bookkeeper, uh, again, a teacher, and kind of dabbled in photography. He then came to Nebraska and started with a photographer here in town in 1884. And at that time, he, I think, got the bug because he later uh, then started his own and bought from Murphy's studio and started his own studio here in Grand Island. He did what was called a glass plate negatives. And in his business, over about 25 years, he kept meticulous records. And we uh, at Stewart Museum are very fortunate to have over 150,000 glass plate negatives that he made. And again, with those meticulous records, we know who paid for it, how much he paid, and why he took the photo. And so it gives a plethora of information for Hall County. But Julius uh, married Minnie Dahl. Actually, her Christian name was Wilhelmina Dahl, which then the Dahl family, they came here in 1885, and Minnie's sister, Anna, married a Lombard, which Lashinsky and Lombard were in business with the photography studio for a while. So as I said, it's a small world. But Julius and Minnie had two sons, Oswald and, um, the name just went out of my head, Armin. And um, Oswald, um, he was kind of, uh, kind of a sickly child. When World War I broke out, um, he, he put in his draft notice, but he didn't make it. But Armin did and went to France. And that's where uh, he, his life ended, was in France with pneumonia. But Oswald, um, he married uh, January of 1926 to a Clara Booth. And six months later, Oswald died. And, but again, very small world we have. Right here in front of us, you see the little stone with the heart shaped on it. That particular one is another symbol of a child's grave, meaning love. Parents love the child, and uh, it's, it's a heart is what it is. And they would bury multiple people in those plots. And again, not everyone is marked. Um, this one I happen to know. This is my people. But um, my uh, great-great-grandmother, she was a Thode. This is the Thode family plot. When uh, she and her husband were first married, they lost a little girl. They didn't have their own plot at the time. So she's actually buried here in the Thode family plot. She's buried, or the, the parents are buried over that way with the Steuben family plot once they finally bought their own plot. But if anyone wants to try it, they're behind this stone right here. It's not marked. There's a baby's grave. I put them closer to my body, but hold them up. Hold them up. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Now, come. Oh, come here. Here. Come right here. No, you're fine. He's... Go ahead and walk. Yeah, see? <laughs> no?
If any of you do try it and you notice that the rods go out instead of cross, some of us have a magnetic personality and they go opposite. I have a friend here and myself, we both go out instead of cross. This, this is a stall grave. If you will look on it real close, it's got two gates on it opened up. That's the gates of heaven leading into heaven is what it amounts to. On the side, you have a dove over here. Usually, if it's a dove with a bud in its mouth, it means that life was cut short or it's on a child's grave before it was matured. This one looks like it's an opened dove. This particular stall grave, I am told, the guy was a Pony Express rider. Uh, with the age, it's very possible because they wanted them uh, in teenagers. So by the time the Pony Express was established, he would have been uh, the right age. Um, now look at the two stones over here, Rickert and Stahl. Look at them close, see who's buried where. F Emil Frederick is buried on the left, his wife is buried on the right. Over on Stahl over there, the mother is on the left, the father is on the right. Does anybody know why? So she can be close to her daughter? Uh, <laughs> 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 I mean, I no, you could be right, who knows. I'm always told that that's the way they stood at the altar when they were married. Oh. You, you, you may have your own way of doing it if you have your own stone bought already or whatever. I don't know how you did yours, but uh, that's what I was told. The other reason is I, I was told that the woman is on the right because she is always right. <laughs> All right, right, amen. Right here behind, I want to show you something real quick. This is the only stone I have ever seen like this. You see a lot in the family plots. They have a big stone that has the family name on it. Walk around this one and see how many family names are on this stone. Are they? Okay. So, I mean, they have four family names on this stone. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah? Okay. But, I mean, a lot of times they'll do whatever the family name is. Like, like I said, over there, well, that was the third one over there. There were multiple... Um, children that were buried there with their spouses. They only put one name, the kind of the family name. But this one, they actually recognized all four of the names on this family stone. So that's kind of an interesting characteristic, I think. I think it's kind of cool. Got me inquisitive about this one. Is the stone clear on the end says infants, but no names on it. So I got to wondering what the deal was. So I come out here and I started dowsing. And again, I said that the rods will cross when I walk over the body. And when I get past, they come apart, and again, and again, as I go. Now, I was wondering about the infants. It says there's plural, so I find one here. And notice that the rods hardly cross, I mean, because it's only so narrow. So there they cross. I barely move. It comes apart. Here comes another one, and there's a third one. The other reason that I can tell that they're infants is that when I go over this way with across the body, I can tell how long they were. This one here is only less than two feet long. So is this one. But when I come over here to the mother, because we know that was an adult, they cross and they will stay across until I get to the end of the grave. So I know that that's an adult versus those are children over there. Uh, President Roosevelt was coming to Grand Island. He was coming through on train. And uh, so, of course, they wanted to roll out the red carpet for him. And President Roosevelt, he was a very avid outdoorsman. Um, he believed in physical exercise, and he wanted to ride. He wanted to go on a ride when he was here. So they lined up. They talked to Mr. and Mrs. Taylor and asked if they could host the president at their ranch north of town. 
Uh, so it was about a 25 mile round trip ride on the horse. They found a very nice horse for the president. He was very impressed with it. Um, but it was kind of the hottest ticket in town. Everyone wanted to go out there and, you know, ride with the president. Although not everyone was accustomed to riding, especially those distances. So that day the president came in, everyone got their horses, they rode out to Taylor Ranch, had a really nice picnic on the lawn, came back, and the next day it was reported in the newspaper that several of the businessmen were walking very strangely. <laughs> So. A, a funny story about the uh, name. He wanted to name his town Sheep. So he petitioned to the United States government and said, I want my town Sheep. And the United States government said, no. So he reapplied shortly after that and reapplied for Ovina, which is Latin for Sheep. That was succeeded. I told you earlier about the bronze markers, and they all uh, uh, designated uh, some type of a fraternity that they belong to. This one does not have a bronze milk marker, but it does have the elk head on it, which is the order of the elks. So instead of putting a bronze marker out for it, they did a uh, carving on the stone itself. And you'll find similar of those. Uh, this is the Payne family plot. And one thing I want to kind of point out here real quick is you've seen some of the plots that have the, the low little concrete barrier around a family plot. This one actually has the cornerstones and they all have P stamped on them. Um, judge Payne was a judge and I, I'm assuming that that is why uh, his, his uh, stone has the columns. Makes me think of something judicial. Uh, the Payne family also had a monument company, which obviously they had access to um, very elaborate stones. So uh, Judge Payne um, and his wife Grace are buried here. Grace's family, the Bentleys, are buried just behind. Uh, Grace Bentley, the story goes, uh, Judge Payne told a joke that he uh, dated every single girl that graduated from the first graduating class of, Grand of the Baptist College. There was only one. It was Grace. <laughs> So, um, the story also cute. goes, yes, cute. The story also goes that uh, Judge Payne um, was very proud of the fact that he met three U.S. presidents. Uh, the first one was, let me get this wrong. Not George, surely. No, 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 not George. Grant. Oh. oh. President Grant. Um, he came through Grand Island on train and he stopped to get something to eat and um, Baird was at the restaurant with his father and his father said, you know, what a cute young man. He sent him over to meet the president and the president ruffled his hair and said, you're going to be a fine young lad, I know. Um, he also saw President McKinley um, at the Trans Mississippi, I think, um, he saw him speak. And then, of course, uh, President Roosevelt as well. And um, there's interesting things here on the stones. I'm going to turn it over to Bill to talk about how, how uh, Judge Payne's stone is so unique. Well, first on the top it says that he was a uh, justice of the Nebraska Supreme Court uh, and the dates. And then he was also judge of the Nebraska Judicial District and uh, the dates there also. But he's also an author of... Uh, the book called Pioneers, Indians, and Buffaloes. And I went on AB Books, and there are eight of them left. They start off at $150 to over $250. Oh, so nice. if you're interested, there are some left. Does the library have one? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. But there are eight left on AB Books, so huh. if you're interested. <laughs> okay. Also over here um, to your right, I guess my my right, your left, whatever. Um, the Dahlstrom stone right here, the um, half finished stone. Supposedly the symbolism behind that is your life is only half finished here when you finish it here on earth and the other half is gonna be finished in heaven. So that's um, one of the interpretations for the symbolism of the half finished stone. And we're not going to walk down this way, but I do want to point out a couple things. Um, a little bit farther here on the other side of the Bentleys, we have the Boyden graves. And the farthest one, the closest to the tree here, you see that little metal marker that's kind of bent over a little bit. That is actually a Daughters of American Revolution marker. 
uh, the Betsy Hager chapter, which is the local chapter here that's still active. Anyone who has been a member of the Daughters of American Revolution can have that marker on their stone. And then right next to the Boydens, um, there's a mausoleum and a pergola. And both of those belong to the Donald family. If you ever get a chance to come out and take a look at them, they're both very beautiful. And the idea of the pergola, too, a lot of times early on, families would make a day of it to go to the cemetery, spend time with the relatives. So you want to have some nice shade where you can sit or a bench. Um, and when you look really closely at the Donald pergola, the vines that wrap up around, it actually does say Donald uh, uh, scrolling around the columns. Um, that is Charles Flippin. He was notorious, uh, well, known to be notorious, but he was a slave, born into slavery. He got his freedom. He actually then fought in the Civil War, did not know how to write nor read, but he taught himself and actually taught his entire platoon how to read and write and became a doctor. But what he was notorious for was performing abortions. His son, George, went to UNL and was one of the first black football players. George also was a doctor and he practiced medicine in Stromsburg. And George is being honored this year at, on the Stromsburg Cemetery Tour. So. Uh, one quick thing about George too. So as Renee said, he was a football player at Nebraska. Um, and this was in the 1890s, and it was not uh, common to have African Americans on your team. So when Nebraska actually took the field against Missouri, Missouri refused to come out of the locker room and play them. So Nebraska won that game that year. You know, we'll we'll take a win any way we can get it. Yeah. Uh, the other thing about Dr. Uh, Flippin that he was so notorious for was his many wives. Um, he was actually married five times, and um, three of them, right, Renee, three were African American and two were white? Four. Four were black and one was was white. And you want to tell the story real quick of his wife that was white? That um, She was from uh, Merrick County, and she um, was extremely young. Uh, he was, she was 19, and he was 62. Um, he he was a very, he was a charmer. Flippin was. He even went to his um, intended's family, asked for his hand for the daughter's hand in marriage, and the father granted it. But then there was issues after the marriage, and the father said, "I never approved of that," and they divorced. And their children, or she had children from another marriage never knew about this until a book was written about Charles and George. And they, they found, you know, we have the marriage record, but the family never knew. She was tight-lipped about it. Charles also raised chickens, and uh, they were uh, champion chickens at the state fair, uh, places like that, all over county fairs. So uh, he took them with him. While we're standing here, there's a marker right back there that's got uh, a lady or a woman hanging on to a cross in it with the C's underneath of it, representing that the troubles or travails of life, and she's hanging on to the cross for uh, saving. And uh, right over here, we have uh, one to the right of uh, Flippin, the uh, one with the book on it. The book could either be a scholarly person or it could have been a uh, Bible, so the person was a religious type person. So there's different meanings for the book. Could have been a school teacher even also. One more quick thing about Dr. Flippin. Um, he served all, all women. He was a female doctor. He didn't just do abortions, but um, he served all women regardless of their income. Black, white didn't matter to him. And when he was, um, they had people trying to take away his medical license because he was performing abortions. He had a lot of supporters who came out in defense of him that were both white and, and African American. So he was, he was well loved by the community. Uh, Carl Culbertson, the one who killed his wife with his, and his daughter knew about it. She was sitting in the car when it happened. This is his grave right here with his first wife. Of course, his second wife is not buried with him. 
Here's an, uh, a different one with the uh, tile mosaics on the side of it, uh, either side, that uh, has their names written on it and uh, the uh, death dates on it. Uh, they're all little pieces of tile, different color, and then uh, they've also got their names uh, in the stone itself, the cement part of it. My right behind the pergola here, um, and your left, there is a tree stump over there. Uh, with the branches cut off. Usually that's a Woodman of America stone. It's an insurance company is what it was who put them out. And uh, the uh, limbs that are cut off means that the siblings that have died before the person uh, was there. But uh, the insurance company was the one who provided the stone for them. That was part of uh, the, uh, the uh, policy. So you'll find not a lot of them, but uh, you'll find them around. This is a bit of a mystery. Um, it is, I think, one of the most unique um, markers out here, um, but I really don't know a whole lot about it. If you come up and you look a little closer, you can see it appears in that center area, there was probably some kind of a light fixture hanging in there, and there's a little um, metal pipe there that makes me think that was some, it was um, fueled by gas of some sort. So this is the Klinger family vault. And if you come up and you look, there actually are slabs over um, Edith and Elmer Klinger. But there's one over the center, too, where it just says Klinger Family Vault. So it makes me wonder, too, if there's actually three people buried here or two. Because, it, I mean, it looks like the other two. So you could if you could get in there, and I'd be afraid to climb over. So, and I don't know if it'll go through concrete or not. <laughs> Can you do anything, Bill? Oh, I don't know if I can do it. If you get stuck, we're leaving you. <laughs> <laughs> Does it lift up? It is in very good shape. <laughs> Hold my paper for me. Yeah. Well... does work through brick. Mm -hmm. I never tried it before. So there are three in here. We now know that. <laughs> and we're going to see if we can get Bill out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the central, uh, the Chapman tour has been canceled this year, folks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ralph Horth and his wife, May. Um, Ralph, uh, he was born in New York State. He came to Nebraska with his parents when he was eight years old. And he then went to, he graduated from here in the Grand Island area, went to Michigan uh, Law School. As soon as he graduated in 1885, he came back to Grand Island and started a law practice. Started a law practice with the Ryans. And that law firm is still in existence today. Of course, there's been some changings of names and things like that, but they're the ones that started Schamburg, Wolf, McDermott, and DuPay. And so that law firm has been in existence that long. Um, he, wa he practiced law until 1930, where then he was appointed a judge. And they, when they memorialized him at his death, they uh, said that he uh, was a fair judge and an honest judge, and he never had any of his decisions overturned or appealed. So that it shows uh, some great um, uh, knowledge and things like that. In 1888, he married May Cassidy from Wyoming. And the Cassidy family actually sold their land for sheep to the tailors. So again, small world. Now the thing is, we, um, we think we have fake news today and scandals. Well, in, um, there's a scandal that, that happened to the Horth family. And in 1891, Supposedly, this is when he's still practicing law, early fairly in his career, 
that he embezzled $1,800 and skedaddled out of town. The newspaper carried this with exorbitant amount of uh, maliciousness and that he was a horrible person and that his wife actually left him and went back to, to Wyoming. For four days, the newspaper was just horrifically awful to them. And then all of a sudden, four days later, nothing. And it was dropped. I've done some research. I've, got, I've tried to find anything. So if we think we have fake news today, <laughs> the newspapers back then had nothing. There was no scandal that ever came out of it. Again, he practiced law until 1930 and then became a judge. He was also a member in good standing at, at the churches here in town. He was a Hall County Commissioner uh, for during the World War I, raised money for the Red Cross. So again, be careful what you read or listen on the news. And his partner over here, Mr. Ryan, uh, his name was actually Charles Gaston Ryan, and he uh, knew Ralph Horth, and he actually came to Grand Island to visit Ralph, and Ralph convinced him to stay here and practice law with him. So he did. He set up shop here with Ralph Horth, and he ended up becoming um, a Hall County attorney. He ran for and was elected Hall County attorney. And at that time, he met a, um, a very lovely young lady. Her name was Evelyn Ryan. She was a school teacher. And her family um, had been in Grand Island for quite a while, were well, were well known. Her father, his name was Michael Murphy. Uh, he was a photographer, a really well-known photographer, earlier than Mr. Lashinsky. Um, Mr. Murphy was also a mayor of Grand Island. So um, Evelyn Ryan, or Evelyn Murphy, married Charles Ryan and set up housekeeping together. Um, Mr. Ryan and his wife were both very democratic, uh, leaning in their politics and their views. Uh, Mrs. Ryan, she became a political force of her own right in the Democratic Party. Um, her mother was one of the early um, signers of Mrs. Abbott's petition in 1882 to get suffrage in Nebraska. If it would have passed, Nebraska would have been the first state to allow women the right to vote. Wyoming, when they started allowing women, was actually not a state at the time. So Nebraska could have been the first, but it failed. It failed miserably. Um, and, I, and it failed, actually, because a lot of people tie the suffrage movement with the temperance movement. And good God, don't take anyone's beer away from them. <laughs> Especially when you've got men voting, because women obviously couldn't vote for it. But Mrs. Ryan, once the women actually did get the right to vote in 1920, she, again, became a political powerhouse. She attended six Democratic National Conventions as either Nebraska's uh, delegate or committee woman. Uh, to those conventions, and she probably would say that she had Williams Jenning Bryant himself sit at her dining room table. Uh, she was very active in a lot of other things, too. She sat on um, the state normal school board, which um, the normal schools that are the predecessors to, like, what is now Kearney State, or what was Kearney State, the state colleges. She was appointed by the governor to sit on the, the normal school board. And Charles himself, even though he was a Democrat, he was really well respected, just like Mr. Horth. And he had been um, tapped by a Republican governor to be a Nebraska Supreme Court judge. Um, it was a great honor for a Democrat to be chosen by a Republican governor, but he politely refused. He said he, had, he thought he had a lot to do in Grand Island. So during World War I, both Mr. Horth and Mr. Ryan were very active in the home front war efforts. Um, so were Mrs. Ryan and Mrs. Horth. Um, they were really kind of power couples, I think, at that time. But um, Mr. Ryan, he passed away in the, um, shortly after World War I. And then Evelyn, like I said, she continued for many years um, being a political force in the state. And um, Charles Ryan actually also ran for and was elected mayor of Grand Island. So Evelyn Ryan is the daughter and wife of a former mayor. Up here on this one here is IHS. You're not I'm from, I don't know. <laughs> no, now you are. Uh, one of the symbols up there in the middle is IHS. Uh, uh, that's Jesus, our Savior. The H in in uh, Latin is a J, so Jesus, our Savior, is what's on that one. And then right behind us is uh, another one with the uh, gates of heaven. It might be able to see it a little better than you did on the other one. And uh, Horse and Ryan's were big contributors to the Episcopal Church, too.
on you know, it goes along with symbolism like Bill has been talking to you about you see so a lot of stones you'll see them in this cemetery too where you see a finger pointing up if you go to the cemetery in Leeds South Dakota you'll see one with the finger pointing down and it says this man was killed at the federal building or a government building I guess that's the way it's worded and I've heard a lot of stories about this they said oh that was a bad person or whatever I've done research on this and I finally got the real story on our last trip to South Dakota this man his name was William Lawrence this happens to be Lawrence County South Dakota also I thought well maybe it has to do with uh, they named the county after him or whatever but that was we've talking about hands okay. I want to talk that, about that okay, I'll turn you off uh, up there this man was working on the federal building which is right by the train depot in Deadwood South Dakota there was a witness standing on the platform at the train depot and he saw what happened they had a boom up there that was putting these giant blocks of limestone or whatever it is on the building well the pin slipped out of the pulley that was holding up the boom the boom fell down hit this guy on the back of the head he was killed instantly that's why on the tombstone it says he was killed at a federal or a government building I did a little more research on the hand pointing down and found out that the hand pointing down is the hand of God reaching down to pull him up because his life was cut short abruptly so I just thought it was a neat story I thought I might share that with you so thanks a lot for coming to our cemetery tours um, we used to have Skip Meyer do these tours for us for a long time and every tour he gave was different now with Michelle and Renee and Bill our tours are, they'll be pretty much the same all weekend for all three tours but when Skip Meyer did this they were different every single time their third the tours were different I've probably been on I don't know 100 maybe 200 of his tours and every single one was different a lot of people had stories that they had brought up and things and we really admire Skip for all the work that he's done for our skip for the cemetery for the Hall County Historical Society over all these years uh, a couple of years ago his wife called me on the day we were having our cemetery tour and she said uh, skips in the hospital he can't do the tour but in the meantime he's gotten a lot better so if if you're interested in a cemetery tour with Skip Meyer uh, you can give him a call and if you have a group he'll you can work out a deal with him and he'll give you a tour also he primarily does the south side of the cemetery and he has a lot of stories but many, yeah. he does a lot more than the Grand Island City Cemetery uh, we've done St. Paul's Cemetery with him and it, all the cemeteries up north here it seems like he knows all of them so it's an enjoyable time to go around with him too and I'd really like to thank Michelle and Renee and Bill for the time they put in and Sue for the time they put in for this tour. There are a lot of stories to tell out here. Um, you know, there's an old joke, people are dying to get in here, haha. -ha. But I also think some of the best people are here too, so. Um, but we are going back to the, the south side next year, but we're actually gonna, Sue and I have talked about it, we're gonna do some different things too over there. Um, tighten it up a little bit you know we didn't we covered a lot of area here but we didn't do a whole lot of walking um, so if you had been on a tour on the south side before you knew that you went the whole way down and back and around we're actually gonna we're breaking it up into sections so one year we'll do kind of the west side one year we'll do the middle one year we'll do the east side and we'll kind of break it up that way too so um, it's gonna be different it's always gonna be different so feel free to come back every year because we'd like to see you and if, I'd like to thank everybody if you're members of the Historical Society thank you for supporting us if you're not a member and if you didn't join today uh, if you did join today you get free admission into our Voices of the Past programs which we have on the second Sunday of the month through the um, the fall and spring and through the winter uh, if you like this program you really like all those programs too we have them at the, at the Burlington Station those programs are at 2 o'clock on the second Sunday of essentially September, uh, October, and uh, also in November. 
Uh, then we we kind of skip December because we have the Stolly House open. We have that treats and stuff over there. Uh, we have again then in January, February, March, and April. And those those programs we have speakers come in, and I've been to almost every one of them since we've had meetings at the depot, which is essentially about the time I got on the board for the Hall County Historical Society. And that was back in about 2000, roughly. And some of the speakers, I should say not some, but darn near all of the speakers have just amazed me all the time. But their knowledge and what they know about history are of that topic. And it's just, it's a wonderful experience. So you're sure welcome to come to those.